Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar. In this week's podcast, Christopher Inton shares his take on cryptocurrency. OnRamp Invest CEO Tyrone Ross gives advisors tips for their crypto-curious clients. And Ben Johnson fills us in on new crypto ETF strategies. Let's get started. Here are Jake Van Kirsten from Morningstar Inc. and Christopher Inton from Morningstar Research Services. A few years ago, financial experts said cryptocurrency was nonsense, but flash forward and now some of them are saying you should have 1% to 2% of cryptocurrency in your portfolio. With the conversation around cryptocurrency changing so quickly, you might be wondering how it works and whether or not you should consider it. The concept of cryptocurrency has been around for years. But the modern cryptocurrency boom began with the launch of Bitcoin in 2009. There are now thousands of cryptocurrencies in existence, but some of the most popular ones include Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Ripple. The basic idea is that units of cryptocurrency are created through mining, in which computers solve complicated math problems to generate coins. The original motivation for this currency was that it's not regulated and under the radar. This is why it's cu- curious that companies like Facebook, who are notorious for tracking everything their users do and governments, have been getting into the crypto game. Hmm. You know, I get the sense that some cryptocurrency enthusiasts might shudder at the thought of regulation, but couldn't that help it in the long run? Well, I think the thing is, if it's going to be a currency, which is its in- original intended purpose, then it doesn't make sense for regulation. But since it's arguably become a store of value or investment asset, regulation could make sense because then it would allow them to purge the bad actors like terrorism, drugs, etc. Long term, do you see cryptocurrency ever being used for day-to-day transactions? We don't think so. And in fact, it seems that it's being referred to one as less and less. Uh, Because there's no consumer demand for cryptocurrency for anything other than investments, its price is entirely predicated on future demand. Which is different than, say, gold, because even if everybody decided that gold wasn't a good store of investment tomorrow, then there would still be a consumer demand for jewelry and whatnot. Right. If everyone decided, decided tomorrow that a cryptocurrency wasn't a good store of investment, There's no real price floor to catch the fall. That makes it super volatile, and that volatility makes it even more difficult to confidently say X Bitcoin is equivalent to X dollars for transactional purposes. Yeah, I remember the story about the guy that bought a pizza for like 10,000 Bitcoins back in 2010 because then it was as low as something like, I don't know, 25 cents or something like that. Which, you know, given that volatility, why are some now suggesting to have cryptocurrency in your portfolio? Crypto is probably best considered as a speculative asset. Some of those experts think it works well as a diversifier because it doesn't seem to be moving with a larger economy. That being said, its short history makes it difficult to stamp that quality with significant certainty. Given that, how could one evaluate whether or not cryptocurrency is good for their portfolio? I guess the first question is, how much are you willing to lose? There's always the possibility that speculative assets could lose all their value. What the risk profile of the rest of your portfolio looks like is a good question too. Adding speculation to something already risky is different than a portfolio of lower risk assets. And lastly, think about your financial situation. Someone that needs asset preservation, like being near retirement, or someone younger in their career have very different financial needs. Chris, I know you don't have a crystal ball or access to a time machine that I know of, uh, but still, I was wondering if you could tell us if you have any expectations for the future of cryptocurrency. It's hard because we're only a little over 10 years into cryptocurrency. We don't have the hundreds of years of historical knowledge that we do for gold. But based on the growing acceptance of cryptocurrency by financial institutions and regulators, uh, there's signs that it might be around for a while. Additionally, it will be interesting to see if anything other than Bitcoin emerges as the top player. 
uh, because there are so many cryptocurrencies out there, it's unclear if there's any real reason why Bitcoin is the one that's really survived and thrived beyond being the biggest and most well-known. Chris, thanks for helping us mine the details from all the buzz about cryptocurrency out there. Expand your investing horizons and look to the long term with Morningstar's podcast, The Long View. Join hosts Christine Benz and Jeff Patak as they talk to influential leaders in investing, advice, and personal finance. Search for and subscribe to The Long View today. Now, here is Ben Johnson from Morningstar Research Services with Tyrone Ross, the CEO of OnRamp Invest. From Morningstar, I'm Ben Johnson. Crypto assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and even JPEGs of digital rocks are on everyone's minds these days, and they're grabbing all sorts of headlines. And it's a topic that is going to be a topic of discussion at this year's Morningstar Investment Conference. And joining us to discuss that topic is Tyrone Ross. Tyrone is the co-founder and CEO of OnRamp Invest. OnRamp Invest is a platform that's aimed at educating advisors and helping them to integrate crypto assets into their clients' portfolios. Tyrone, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to this chat. So let's dig in. I, I want to know, Tyrone, what is top of mind for advisors right now when it comes to looking at crypto assets for their clients? What's the biggest challenge that they face as we sit here today? I think it's multifaceted. I think the first is education, but you start to branch out from there on, do I know what the regulatory environment is truly? Do I have a good framework for that and compliance and then E and O? and you know building my practice to prepare to give advice and allocate on behalf of clients if that's the case i think the other thing right now is obviously just simply the volatility right the speculation that is going on advisors are very much looking at this and saying okay is it worth me taking the risk of putting half a percent or one percent or three percent of an allocation of bitcoin into client portfolios having to deal with that call um, when it's down 80% in three months. So, you know, I think it's it's those things when you cobble them together, it just simply, all right, where do I start? Where do I go? Is there one place for me, an advisor, to get started on this? But it all goes back to education. Now, Tyrone, I'm, I'm interested to know because you've had countless conversations with countless advisors. You come from a place of having once been an advisor yourself. When you have these conversations, you, what are the common traits of, of models that advisors have in place today where they're helping their clients to succeed and, and integrate crypto assets? And, and alternatively, you know, what does the model for success look like where it, it might not be the right fit for a client and an advisor might have to you know, educate them not only on crypto assets, you know, Bitcoin 101, but why it might not necessarily be a good fit for that particular client? Right. So I'll start with what you just said. I think I tell financial advisors this all the time. Most financial advisors really shouldn't be saying anything to their clients about this right now, but learning and leading to have the conversation, just simply be conversant, prepare your practice, take client questions and concerns, but leave your opinion at the door, just simply be conversant. To that end, I think right now there's a lot of hotels for advisors, so to speak, to get themselves integrated into the space to get access for clients. Are they the best? Are they the most efficient? That's not up for me to say, which is you, you get into the Bitcoin ETF conversation as well, why advisors want that, which pairs with the other part of your question is integrating it into the conversation of portfolios for clients. If it's easy, if it's seamless, an ETF does that, right? OnRamp is trying to do that. It's a lot easier to see the client's whole financial life and say, okay, well, Mr. And Mrs. Client, you have one of those 60 million Coinbase accounts, right? Let's pull that into your portfolio and take a look and have a conversation. Any advisor is simply doing what an advisor is supposed to do, be a trusted fiduciary for their client. I think once the rails and all the integration points are there, it'll be a lot easier for advisors to do that as opposed to trying to find out everything on their own, but simply do it right from their existing workflow. Uh, Tyrone, something you mentioned is, is, is you know, there are a number of different ways today for investors, for advisors to, to allocate to, to crypto assets, to Bitcoin, to Ether, you name it. Uh, one of the ways that gets sort of the most attention is, is really the one way that today no one can invest in Bitcoin, which is a Bitcoin ETF. 
You know, what's your take on wrapping you know, this crypto asset or any crypto asset like Bitcoin in an ETF package? Oh, you know, that's a setup. You know, I don't like that. Um, I'm a big fan of holding the underlying, not a fan of a Bitcoin ETF, but we are going to get one. It's just like if you want to hold GLD or if you want to hold the actual gold bars, you can. I'm a big fan of holding the underlying. I'm a purist. Um, and I believe there, there comes a, a lot of benefits with that for advisors and their clients when you actually hold the underlying and everything you could do inside of the crypto economy. Now, I understand, don't necessarily agree, but understand the arguments for a Bitcoin ETF. I'm sure this will come up with myself and Matt Hogan. It always does um, because advisors, again, it's easy. Advisors need to, you know, they want to get paid. Right. And it's also very similar to buying Apple. They can do it the same way with the Bitcoin ETF and it's seamless and it's right in their workflow. I completely understand it. But being a purist, it makes my skin itch when we talk about putting a 21st century new and novel asset class going all the way back you know, to the 20th century and sticking it in there and saying, all right, something that trades 24-7, 365, we're going to stop, slow it down and put it in this box so we can sell it to retail investors. Angers me. <laughs> well, Tyrone, I, I, I want to thank you first and foremost for making me not be alone uh, yeah. among the Bitcoin ETF skeptic crowd, which gets yeah. thinner by the day. And yeah. thank you for joining us today to, to share your insights. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. The only way to fix the B Bitcoin ETF conversation is Bitcoin futures ETF. And now, that, now we're talking <laughs> investor protection. Unbelievable. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate you. Lastly, Ben Johnson talks about Bitcoin ETFs. Hi, I'm Susan Chabinski with Morningstar. The first Bitcoin futures exchange traded funds are about to begin trading. Joining me today to discuss these strategies in particular and the prospects for other cryptocurrency related funds waiting in the wings is Ben Johnson. Ben is Morningstar's global director of ETF research. Hi, Ben. Thank you for being here today. Hi, Susan. Thank you for having me. So uh, the SEC greenlighted the first futures-based Bitcoin ETFs, and there are a few other futures-based Bitcoin funds waiting in the wings. But these funds will not be investing directly in Bitcoin. Tell us a little bit about these strategies. Well, that's the all-important point here, Susan, is that these Bitcoin ETFs are, are not the Bitcoin ETFs that I think many investors are, are looking for, frankly. They're the Bitcoin ETFs that SEC Chairman Gary Gensler and his colleagues at the SEC will allow for the time being, and they will allow them almost explicitly, almost exclusively, because they invest not in actual Bitcoin, but in Bitcoin futures. And as opposed to actual Bitcoin, Bitcoin futures are already an established financial product that are regulated, that are traded on an exchange, that have more there there, if you will, than underlying Bitcoin, which is an area of the market where in all its many comments on the various filings for Bitcoin ETFs, be they futures based or chiefly physical, the SEC has really raised fundamental concerns with respect to chiefly fraud and market manipulation. The SEC's concerns as it pertains to Bitcoin futures ETFs are clearly far fewer given that they didn't so much green light these ETFs as they didn't give them a red light. So now, despite, despite the obvious risks, right, of investing in something as volatile as Bitcoin, what are the other risks that investors need to be aware of when they're investing in these futures-based strategies? Well, let, let's not for a moment let the primary risk here be set aside, which is that Bitcoin is an immensely volatile asset class. It's still very new. It's still very unclear what is sort of the fundamental story there that, that drives its value. The narrative around why Bitcoin is worth anything at all is really shifted, but it's gotten to the point where enough people have believed that it's worth something for long enough to give it a significant amount of value as it stands today. Its total market cap, if you want to use that term, is in excess of a trillion dollars. So the fundamental risk here still the big risk, capital R risk, is the risk of Bitcoin itself, the volatility, and frankly, the behavioral issues that that might present. 
investors historically have had a very difficult relationship with volatile assets, buying exactly at the wrong time often uh, and often selling at exactly the wrong time. Now, secondary to that, and secondary, I would say, by a mile, has everything to do with the fact that these ETFs will invest, again, in Bitcoin futures and not actual Bitcoin. So by virtue of investing in actual Bitcoin futures, what you see is that there are some issues, most notably, related to maintaining that exposure. So it's the intention of most of these ETFs to invest in the front month futures contract. That front month futures contract, like any futures contract, is going to expire. And when that futures contract expires, the funds will have to invest in another month's futures contract, and they have a bit of latitude as to how they allocate across a variety of different Bitcoin futures contracts. And what can happen in the process is that if that next futures contract or those next futures contracts are trading at prices that are above the ones that the fund currently owns, they will be in effect systematically selling low and buying high. Now, in futures markets, the shape of that curve is often known as contango, which is not a dance, but a way to lose money by trying to maintain exposure to an underlying commodity or Bitcoin in this instance by virtue of investing in it through regularly rolling futures contracts. Uh, and it's something that, depending on the shape of the futures curve, so if it's particularly steep, can be particularly costly. And indeed, we've seen this movie before with oils futures contracts, natural gas futures contracts, and the ETFs that have offered investors exposure to those underlying commodities. The other risk investors should be aware of is tax risk. So unlike traditional ETFs, these ETFs are going to deal chiefly in cash. So they're not going to be bringing in futures contracts on an in-kind basis, sending them out the back door on an in-kind basis. They're going to be dealing in cash. So there could potentially be tax costs to be cognizant of as well that investors will absorb potentially irrespective of whether or not they're buying and selling these funds themselves. Another very important risk that investors in a Bitcoin futures ETF need to be aware of is that there is a strict limit on the amount of any given futures contract that these funds can own. Now, if these funds were to gather enough assets such that they would bump up against these limits, there is the risk that they would actually have to suspend new share issuance. So they would have to close their doors to new investors. And what would happen as a result in all likelihood is that these ETFs prices could trade at a significant premium to their underlying net asset value, which isn't a good situation for anyone involved and, and certainly not investors, at least not those that are trying to liquidate to try to capitalize on that temporary premium. Now, if this all sounds very familiar, it's a scenario that we've seen play out historically with those ETFs that also access underlying markets via futures, most notably and most recently with USO, the United States Oil Fund, which uses futures contracts to tap into oil markets. And then Ben, who are some of the asset managers behind these futures-focused Bitcoin ETFs? So if you look at the litany of asset managers that have filed for Bitcoin ETFs, the first out of the gate is going to be ProShares with their Bitcoin ETF strategy ETF. The ticker for that fund is going to be BITO. So that is going to launch as we sit here today, tomorrow, Tuesday, October 19th. Now there are others that may follow soon behind, including Valkyrie, Invesco, Vanek, and others that are still further down the path. I would not be surprised that a month or two months from now, we see a minimum of a half dozen different Bitcoin futures-based ETFs out there on the market competing for investors' assets. And then now that the SEC has approved these futures-based Bitcoin ETFs, what does that mean for other types of crypto strategies awaiting approval in that ETF wrapper? Well, now that the SEC has let Bitcoin futures ETFs pass, I think the question on many's minds is when might the SEC allow for 
Bitcoin ETFs that invest directly in Bitcoin itself to see the light of day. I'm not about to make a guess there. My best guess is that the SEC probably feels that it's bought itself a sufficient amount of time to give that can a good firm kick further down the road. In the meanwhile, the SEC is going to have any number of different asset managers knocking on its door, making the case for an ETF that invests directly in underlying Bitcoin. Most recently and most notably was Bitwise Asset Management, which pushed across a 100-plus page research document further trying to bolster the case for an ETF that would directly invest in underlying Bitcoin. Frankly, I think that's the ETF that most investors want. Frankly, whether or not you believe Bitcoin is a good investment, I think it would be a superior offering to what we've got coming here imminently, which is these ETFs that invest in not Bitcoin, but Bitcoin futures. Well, Ben, thank you so much for your perspective today on these new breed of ETFs that we're going to be seeing seeing tomorrow, it looks like. Thanks for your time. Thanks again for having me, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski. Thanks for tuning in. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. The podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax advice. Please consult a tax and or financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Research Services, LLC, is a subsidiary of Morningstar, Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analysis, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.